So in this video I'm going to talk about glazing. I'm going to glaze a couple different forms, but on the goblet here I'm going to talk about one way of preparing for a glaze. First is going to be wax resist. I've got two different waxes here. One's a standard one. Um, this ends up drying a little bit harder, a little less sticky, so it doesn't transfer as much after it dries. And we have the Laguna, which is what well, I guess people are more com or commonly involved with. It's a little bit thicker. I usually cut it 50% um, with water. And this is the pot. So it's got a flat bottom. First, I always check to make sure there aren't boogers stuck to it. So normally I would do this right when it's um, finished, but I want to make sure that there aren't any sharp spots, any edges that, that need to be cleaned up. And this one's already clean. If it was, there was a burr or a booger stuck to it, I would scrape it off and either sand it with a piece of silicon carbide shelf or silicon carbide um, sandpaper. So I usually don't wax the bottom of my pots, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you all the ways I know how, but recommend certain ones. So I usually use a cheap brush, one that I'm not all that fond of. I'm going to take the wax. I'm going to start on one side, and I want to make sure I cover all of it. Some people add food coloring to their wax so they can tell where they've been, um, especially on lighter clays. On darker clays, it has a tendency to darken the clay a little bit when it dries, so that's not always necessary. Once the wax is on there, and you're pretty confident that it's all covered, you need to let it dry. If you let the wax, if you glaze a pot with the wax still wet, the glaze will get into the wax, and then the wax will not come off and the glaze won't come off. You'll have to, you know, really scrub it or scrape it away. Now, there are a couple problems that I find with wax. One is that if you touch it somewhere that you didn't mean to, it's there permanently. Example, when I went to go set this pot down, I set it on the bristles of the brush and I got some on the lip. Now, to get that off, I know people have tried alcohol or kerosene and paint thinner. Um, I'd rather not deal with that. Um, the only option is to really rebisque it but this is a demonstration and I'm not going to do that. Reason number one not to use wax. Reason number two is transfer. So if I touch the wax container and I get it on my finger and I touch my pot, for example, this stuff is all dry up here and I'm going to just touch it. I'm going to get some on my finger. can't see it, you can't really feel it, but it's there. I'm going to touch a part of the pot. Now hopefully when I glaze it you'll be able to see that. Now the other wax is similar, except it dries a little bit stiffer, so it doesn't transfer as well, or as much. The other option is to not wax the piece at all. Again, you want to make sure it's clean on the bottom, clean around the lip, but you don't want to wax. You don't want to touch it with wax. You're just going to clean off the bottom after. So those are the two basic ways. Some people use paraffin. I've never used paraffin. Um, it seems like wax and heat and fire and bad stuff happens with paraffin. So I. I haven't done it all, and I probably will never do it. So this is one of the pretty much standby glazes here at the studio. It's called Coastal Blue. Um, I know pretty much that this glaze is the right consistency, but if you're going back to a glaze you haven't used in a while, you'll find that there's a layer of water on the surface. Now, if it's a studio glaze, and you know you know what you're doing. I would take this layer of water off, mix up the glaze, and see if it's thick enough. If not, I'd add the water back slowly. But I find that a lot in studio atmospheres that somebody might add water to it. You go to mix it up. Once you mix it up, the water's you know mixed in, and you can't use that glaze because it's too thin. If you take the water off ahead of time, before you go to use it, you know it, the extra water is already gone. You don't have to worry so much about having to remove the water later. So, to mix a glaze, I use my hand. Um, the drill mixers and using a paddle um, doesn't work for me. I know all the glazes that I use and all the glazes that I'm ever involved with are pretty safe. None of them have barium, none of them have anything that's water soluble. There's no ash in any of these glazes. It's pretty much feldspar clay, iron, and copper. So I make sure I get all the lumps. The reason I don't use a mixer is I, so I can feel a lump. You can't feel a lump with a mixer. So I can run my hand in, I can tell if there's a lump, if there's stuff settled to the bottom, if there's a hard spot. You can't do that when you have a mixer or a paddle. 
this lets me, you know, make sure that the glaze is really consistent. That and mixing it up gives me a feel for the glaze. If it's if it's a little on the thin side or a thick side, I can feel it. I mean, you can't feel it right away, but after some practice, you can. So this glaze is mixed. So on a bowl shape, I usually trim a foot onto my bowl. See this edge here? This is so I can hold on to it when I glaze. Um, some people use tongs. So a tong looks like this. These are a set of glazed tongs. I don't use them. I'm not sure why. I just it's just another tool. But I'm going to do this one so you can sh so you can see. Now, for for people that are squeamish, I'm going to break this pot as an example. You would hold, you'd take the pot by the tongs, and you would squeeze. Now, if this was a big pot, you'd have to squeeze pretty hard. Now, once you have the pot gripped, you would dip it in the glaze, cover everything. Lift it up, shake it off. Now, if it was a big pot, you'd have to squeeze pretty hard. If you've trimmed it light enough, you'd probably put a hole in it, like that. Now, once you've put a hole in it, you've got your pot in the glaze with the hole, and you've also got all the little chunks from it breaking. Now this glaze needs to be screened. Tons of fun that is. So here's one with the wax. I'm grabbing it by the bottom. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to spin it, and I'm going to pick it up. Put it closer here. So I'm going to put it in, spin it, pick it up, shake it off. Now, you can already see, that's the part where I transferred the wax from my finger. And there's the wax on the edge from when it touched the brush. Uh, the glaze or the wax on the bottom repelled the glaze. That's super and it'll be easier to clean off. But we're going to compare that to whether or if we didn't do this. So put that aside. This is a bowl. Again, there's the foot at the bottom. I'm going to grab it by the foot. I'm going to hold it on its side. I'm going to turn it upside down. I'm going to shake it. And I'm going to lift it up and flip it over. When you shake it, the glaze sloshes on the inside and covers everything. On the outside, shaking it also covers it. Now if the glaze gets on the foot, that's okay. I'm going to be able to clean it off after. So it's on its side. Shake it. Lift it up. And there we go. I'm going to set that aside. Do one more. Have a little vase. Same thing with the foot. Put it in, spin it, pick it up. Shake it off, flip it over. Easy. Now, to clean off the bottom of a pot, I'm going to take a wet sponge, I'm going to hold the pot upside down, I'm going to spin it and wipe. Now that's how long it took to clean off the bottom of a pot. Now, compared to the wax, and in terms of applying it, and the nuisance it can cause, I think that just wiping it off ends up being a lot easier. Again, you just rub it a couple times, spin it, and it's clean. Wax one still has glaze on it. You still have to wipe it, still have to get it to come off. Doesn't make as much sense to me.